Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, webinar number seven in the second of our Lunchtime Light Bulb series, Getting the Most Out of Your People and Projects. This webinar is titled Performance Management During Probation. We're so pleased to have you along. For those of you who haven't met me yet, if that's even possible, my name is Sarah Sabell and as usual I'm joined today by Michael Meir, Cal Director and Lecturer. Hi Michael. Hello Sarah, hello everybody. <laughs> now just before we get started, a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar will run for between 30 and 45 minutes depending on your questions at the end and I've had a look and Michael's got a lot of quality juicy information for you so it will probably head towards the 45 minute mark. If you do have questions that you would like to ask Michael, please feel free to jot them down in your questions or chat box on your dashboard there and I will have Michael answer them for everyone to hear. And this webinar will also be made available to you once we're done here. I'll make sure the link to YouTube and the presentation is sent to you later today. We've had a number of students request a webinar on the probationary period of performance and the performance management process. So here we are tackling two rather contentious topics that together can be a fairly volatile mix, but that's today's topic, performance management during probation. There seems to be a lot of interest in and misinformation about this uh, in online discussions and it's an area of employment law and HR practice that is not clearly understood nor applied consistently in Australian workplaces. So um, there seems to be a lot of, oh sorry, so in today's webinar we thought we'd unpack the mystery and give you the facts as well as some tools and tips to ensure you get it right and most effectively manage the most expensive resource in your organisation, that being your people. A probationary period is effectively a separate fixed term employment contract that, proceed, that precedes your permanent employment relationship. The purpose of the probationary period is to allow the employer an opportunity to ascertain your suitability to perform the role before committing to offering you an ongoing permanent employment agreement and of course it is an opportunity for the new employee to check the job out and to make sure the job and the organisation is a good fit for them as well. Now there is no requirement under the Fair Work Act to have a probationary period in an employment contract. Instead the Act uses the term minimum employment period and this applies under the Act to all new employees. So regardless of whether or not a new employee's employment is subject to a probationary period under the Fair Work Act, an employer can still terminate an employee's employment for any reason within the minimum employment period without unfair dismissal laws applying. And we'll come back to this again shortly. But before we do, let's see who we've got in the room with us today. And we'll run a quick poll that you will see on your screen in just a minute. How often have you had to deal with performance management issues during probation? And you will have the options there of 0 to 20%, 20 to 40%, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, or 80 to 100. And we're just waiting for a few more votes to come in. So far we've got between 0 and 20, Michael, and between 40 and 60 is a dead heat at the moment. So 100% have voted and a majority have actually voted between the 0 and 20% mark, followed closely behind by the 40 to 60% mark. Does that surprise you, Michael? Um, yes and no, Sarah. I'm surprised that uh, there's been such a low rate. But the 33%, that's uh, a third of people out there in the 40 to 60%, uh, that's a fairly big number. Anyway, let's press on. It can happen in workplaces. Um, Sarah, I thought our topics today would be um, understanding minimum employment periods and probation, uh, unfair dismissal and probationary periods, uh, frankly what to do at the commencement during probation, then the the Fair Work Act itself and providing uh, probationary periods, what reports and records you should be keeping and of course your questions. So let's start with understanding minimum employment periods and probation. Uh, now as you quite rightly noted Sarah, there's still a bit of confusion about probationary period of employment. So let's just review what you said in the introduction. Probationary periods of employment 
do not automatically apply to every employment contract and there's no legal requirement for them. In fact, it will only apply if such a term has been expressly agreed to by both parties, which usually means your employer has uh, inserted a clause in your employment contract uh, uh, with an agreement stating that your employment will be subject to a probationary period and you agreed to work a probationary period by signing the employment contract. The probationary period must be reasonable, taking into account the nature of the position. Uh, for example, it would be hard to justify a probation period of less than three months for an administrative uh, position, whereas uh, a probation period of six months may be quite reasonable for a new salesperson who's being employed to gain sales in a new district, or a, a CEO or senior manager uh, is being employed to change an organisation. So, Seniority also plays a part. Most roles in middle management and upwards are given a six month probationary period and that's usually because it gives a better idea of the ability uh, to gauge cultural fit which is really important across all roles but really important for those in senior roles, senior management jobs. So as with all terms of employment uh, agreements, there can be agreement to negotiate the removal of uh, a probationary period of a clause um, if, uh, and prior to signing it or the request that the uh, probationary period be shortened. However, this sort of clause is not, uh, not unusual and you'll find that in most employment contracts and even in letters of office have probation periods included. Um, employees are entitled to request that it is uh, removed and this is often the case where a new employee is taking up a position in, say, another state or has to make a fairly big personal move to take up the new role. So uh, a six-month probation period can be quite unsettling for them, but there is no obligation on the part of the employer to remove such a clause. It's, it's up to the individual to request it. Uh, an employee must, must, be advised in writing of any extension to their probationary period prior to the initial period ending. It's therefore critical that the probation reports are received by the department or person looking after the company's recruitment services well in advance so they've got time to act on it. If a person uh, works past the end date of the probationary period without being notified by their employer, that it is not chosen to offer permanent uh, and ongoing employment, well, then this generally means automatically that the employee relationship has become permanent and ongoing and therefore the employer becomes subject uh, to unfair dismissal laws. Now, aside from this optional probationary period, there's also a qualifying period under the Fair Work Act. The, the Act states that uh, employees are excluded from making uh, an unfair dismissal application until they've completed either a 12-month period uh, for small uh, employers or a six-month qualifying uh, period for larger employees, that's employers over 15 employees. This uh, qualifying period is quite distinct from a probationary period. However, both periods run concurrently from the first day of employment. Right, so we have an optional probationary period that is inserted into the employment contract and agreed to by the employer and employee and we also have the Fair Work Act qualifying period under which an employer can terminate an employee's employment for any reason within the minimum employment period without unfair dismissal laws applying. Yeah, sure, that's it. Um, the Fair Work uh, Act of 2010 it excludes employees from bringing an application for uh, unfair dismissal within the minimum employment period. Now the minimum employment periods affects all employment arrangements covered by the Fair Work Act and as we've said, an employee is excluded from bringing an application uh, for unfair dismissal during this period. Michael, you talked briefly about unfair dismissal and probation. Would you care to elaborate? Uh, yes, Sarah, and look, you'll find that I go back over things quite a few times uh, during the course of this webinar. Look, now, as we said, look, the, the Fair Work Act provides protection for employees uh, from unfair dismissal, 
where they've completed a minimum period of employment of six months or the three months from the commencement of their employment uh, if the uh, employer is not a small business or 12 months if it's a larger business. So for many small business owners with uh, 15 or less employees, there is a full 12 months for an initial employment period where an employer can, employee sorry, can be dismissed without uh, incurring unfair dismissal claims. That was a Freudian slip on my part because uh, employees very often terminate <laughs> their relationship with their employer on absolute minimum notice and no penalty. Um, probationary periods on the other hand uh, are no, le no longer legally, legally mandated and they apply where they are included in a written contract of employment um, which should detail the beginning and end date of the probationary period. They're usually for a three to six months uh, period, but can be longer where necessary due to the type of position. If no written employment agreement exists, the employee's employment uh, will not be subject to probationary periods, but the minimum employee uh, period will still apply. Now, it's important to note that you cannot extend a probation period unless it's stated in writing at the commencement of employment. If this condition is not in writing prior to the commencement of employment and you extend the probationary period beyond the initial term, uh, it will not provide you with protection from unfair dismissal proceedings. So it's important that you uh, make sure that the necessary employment dates are recorded and that the uh, employee's uh, line manager is very well aware of it as well. An employee is exempt uh, from uh, uh, commencing unfair dismissal process if their employment is terminated during the uh, probationary period or the minimum employment period, whichever is the longer. So it's important to clearly understand the beginning and end date of the minimum employment period, even uh, to within a matter of hours. As uh, Once an employee has uh, work beyond the minimum hours of the probation end date, then the employee is to be considered as ongoing and that is fully employed by the organisation. Uh, it's also important to note that although an employee may be exempt from commencing unfair dismissal proceedings, they are not excluded from making claims for unlawful termination. Unlawful termination is where an employee employee's employment is, con, uh, is terminated for a prohibited reason contained in the uh, Fair Work Act and, uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't have any references in it to probationary period. Likewise, an employer is not protected during this period from claims related to harassment or discrimination and so on and this is where poor and or uh, inconsistent management can come into bear. So, it's important that you take time to explain and document the processes during probationary periods. Uh, it's also important to note uh, that uh, it's, it's not acceptable to merely terminate a new employee without having a sufficiently valid reason. And while the uh, employer is protected against uh, unfair dismissal during this period, there must be some other protections afforded to a new employee under the uh, denial of uh, workplace right. And so again, look, regular review and evaluation is critical during the uh, probationary period and employers have an obligation to notify the employee of the reasons for the decision to terminate employment. Uh, now that will, and where you're following uh, procedure, come from these notes and discussions occurring uh, throughout uh, the probationary period. It's also important to note that uh, an employee cannot be terminated for uh, uh, an unlawful reason. Uh, this includes temporary uh, absences uh, due to uh, work or illnesses. Um, employees terminated within their uh, first uh, 12 months of employment must get at least one week's uh, uh, notice of termination unless they're a casual employee, fixed term employee or terminated because of uh, serious misconduct. Now, it's also crucial that you record dates correctly and adhere to them as planned because if you're a day or just a few over hours over the end date, then your employee can quite correctly claim unfair dismissal.
Michael, it sounds to me that the key it sounds like to me the key skills here lie in accurate record keeping. That is making sure the probationary employment dates are stated clearly in the employment contract and also visibly noted by all parties. That is the HR or recruitment department and line managers so that all necessary actions can be addressed and completed prior to the end date. Have you got some tips for getting it right from the get-go, Michael? Uh, sure, you did set right. Um, it is simple record keeping and adherence. Um, but it's a bit more than that also. It's surprising, look, how few employers, employers actually follow a set process for probation. Many seem to think that they can just insert the start and end dates and that's that. Nothing more to do until the end date rolls over and the employee is put on the staff. Look, this is a practice uh, many employers follow until something goes wrong and then they look back at what they've done or more accurately not done and regret and that's putting it mildly. Um, I regret what follows. Now, um, this is more tangible uh, than, than for many companies that find themselves charged with unfair dismissal and then find and then are fined significant sums of money and all because they've not bothered to follow a process. So then, look, here's a few f simple steps uh, you can follow to ensure you're complying with the Fair Work Act and not leaving yourself and your company open to litigation. Uh, and this really is the next part of today's tutorial. Uh, what to do at the commencement of and during probation. Once the uh, employment contract has been signed and at the commencement of uh, an employee's probationary period, the first thing you or the employee's line manager needs to do is sit down with the new employee and explain the probation uh, process. Now I'm assuming here that the new employee has had an induction to the company and uh, is ready to commence the job for which they've been hired. If uh, that's not the case, then you must spend uh, adequate time on induction and induction related activities before you commence the uh, probation period. Now, with regard uh, to the formal uh, commencement uh, of the probation period, you need to explain the probation process and what it entails, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, this really should be done on day one of employment, or at least as soon as practical, once the new employee commences, as remember the induction period starts counting down from day one on the job. So. Uh, even if that's spent in induction related activities rather than uh, on the job work. You need to uh, explain the nature of their duties and particularly the standards expected of them. Now here you need to include regular or rostered attendance times and uh, how flex flexi time might work if you've got it. You need to explain general conduct expected as well as dress codes where applicable, behaviour towards colleagues and customers. Uh, if there's a customer service charter or code of behaviour, then you may be sure that the employee uh, sees and understands this. And uh, Now much of this uh, may also be done during induction process, but even uh, where it is, it is important in the context of this probationary period that you review it again and clearly state what the expectations are. Now, you must inform the employee in writing of the criteria and objectives to be met for the appointment to be confirmed once the probationary period is over. So the first thing you really need to do here is get a copy of the job description and go through it with them. And here you need to detail the work or job level and the skills that must be demonstrated by the end of the probationary period. Now remember that the probationary period is the time during which both you and the new employee decide whether or not the job and the organisation is a good fit for the person. Many managers use this period to enable the employee to get up to speed with new or difficult technology and processes and so on. And where this is the case, you need to make it very clear that by the end of the probationary period, for example, you expect the new employee to be able to use the, uh, say, finance system competently or whatever the job requires, or if so, it's an advanced level. And it's particularly important if the uh, software you, you might be using is proprietary. Uh, for most uh, of the more common off-the-shelf software, the uh, employee should come up with these skills or 
should have them already. You, uh, you should also refer back to the criteria and objectives set out in the job description and list the criteria and objectives expected by the end of the probationary period. And it's important to do that. Now, this gets more critical as job seniority grows. For example, you might expect an admin to a support person to demonstrate more general job behaviours we talked about a minute ago, but managers and for more technical appointments there must be detailed technical and comprehensive skills and these should be listed. It's a good idea to list these in a performance document that lists the criteria and objectives, the actions, level of competence and date and have both you and your new employee sign uh, off on it as agreed performance plan for the probationary period. Where you, can, uh, where you can, it's also really a good idea to break these objectives and actions up into smaller and more achievable uh, packages by nominating, nominating dates along the way. So for example, if you've agreed a three month probationary period, then you can nominate specific actions or goals to be achieved each week or fortnight or even a month over the three month period. This is easier to track and monitor progress uh, as you meet to discuss uh, performance during the probationary period. The, the final action that you need to, uh, to do at the beginning is to nominate and schedule performance review dates. Uh, as you would with any other performance review, I really recommend that you do this in consultation with the new employee so that they feel consulted and engaged with during the process. Uh, it's probably uh, timely to note here, Sarah, that uh, whilst new employees are treated differently to uh, regular employees uh, with regard to the amount of time spent with supervisors during their probationary period, the level of responsibility and accountability should remain the same. From day one of employment, you should be setting expectations to ensure new employees fully understand and are able to meet the responsibilities of their role. Well, you do make it sound so simple, Michael, but I rarely see managers taking the time out to do this step properly. It seems to me that by the time the new employee has been through the selection process and been inducted by the manager, the manager's keen to get him or her started on the job. Um, they just don't want or perhaps don't see the need to schedule even more time than yet for another meeting before the work commences, let alone a whole series of meetings throughout the probationary period. Unfortunately, I've also seen this cost organisations an awful lot of time and money when things go wrong with the new employee and these actions have not been followed. Aside from the cost to an organisation when things go wrong, there's also the more hidden cost of disengagement at this very early stage of employment. We all know the costs associated with recruitment and so if we've prepared if we're prepared to spend the time and the money recruiting the best person for the job and then putting them through the probationary period to make sure the match is perfect well it makes sense that we actually take the time to make sure the new employee is clear on what is required of them and that they know they have their line managers support to build their skills and learn new and unfamiliar processes in a supportive environment during the probation. A supportive probation goes a long way to engaging the new employee and ensuring they are on side with the organisation, their line manager and their team. So then Michael, what should we be doing uh, during the probationary period? Um, Sarah, during the probationary period it's, it's uh, critical that you firstly regular monitor the performance of the employee and give regular feedback uh, in addition to uh, the probation reports required. Uh, regular feedback provides the opportunity for the employee to rectify any performance problems that, that occur during this probationary period. Uh, there's also the time to provide specific on-the-job training and development opportunities to help the new employee perform their job. Most often this will include one or more coaching sessions, for example, in, in how to, to use maybe, say, soft, proprietary software properly, or to prepare reports in accordance with, say, business requirements, etc., depending on the job. Now, the, the new employee may require to attend specific training policies, such as discrimination and so on, uh, what's required for workplace uh, health and safety. 
For a senior manager, their time might be spent networking with uh, stakeholders and uh, establishing new business relationships. Now, Fair Work Australia has provided some really useful tips for employers on managing poor performance during probation, uh, and I really suggest that uh, people review it. They can access it. You can see the uh, address there on the on the screen. It's also important that you not only conduct agreed performance review meetings, as uh, we've already outlined, but it's really important that you complete the paperwork. The job's not done until you've completed the paperwork. Um, this needs to be done in the same way that you'd conduct normal performance management review meetings. And so when you're finished, you may need to be make sure the paperwork is signed off by both the line manager and the employee. And you also need to employ, uh, provide the employee with a copy. Where there are issues and or actions that require attention, you should discuss these with the employee and in the same manner that you would uh, during normal performance appraisals meetings and you must provide them with an opportunity to respond to issues. Now that's usually done within a set period, say seven days. Even during the probationary period, employees must be given the opportunity to improve their performance. This means that they need to have all the tools they need to do the job and that any shortfall in performance is clearly flagged to the employee so that they are in no doubt as to the performance level required as well as the current shortfall. Now, if the probationary period is longer than three months, and it's much more common these days to see periods up to, uh, to six months, then you can uh, cut down your formal reviews after the first three months, especially if you're doing those uh, in the first three months weekly or bi-weekly, but you must complete further probation report periods for each month for the entire five months before with the final report being done, and these should be sent to recruitment services at, at least two weeks. Uh, prior to the confirmation date. Now, as I noted earlier, it's really critical and failure to do so it may result in your unsatisfactory new employee uh, moving into ongoing status instead of ex ex exiting the organisation. This applies even in lieu of a written contract if the employee continues to work for even a day after the written end of the probationary period. Well, uh, an ongoing contract is just assumed. All completed probation reports should be filed with the HR department by the designated date. If the new employee has not performed to the agreed level documented, then you're entitled to decline an offer of employment contract, but you must put this in a letter to the employee at least one week prior to the end of the probationary period, and they must be given a reason. Where the employee has uh, successfully completed the probationary period, you'd need to have an employment contract ready for the employee to review and sign, either on or prior to the last day uh, of probation. Regular meetings. Now, as I've noted, uh, it's really important that you maintain regular contract with, contact with the employee during their probationary period, and, and this can be done both formally and informally. Formal contact usually takes the form of a scheduled meeting uh, or meetings, and here I would recommend at least fortnightly meetings for the first six to 12 weeks, maybe reducing back to monthly meetings after the first three months or earlier if things are going well and you and your employee are really quite confident that there are no issues. This, of course, will depend on the status of the job and the person in the role. A more experienced person may will require less, whilst a new recruit may require even more regular meetings. Informal contact is also important and you should try and touch base with uh, your new employee every day or at least every other day. These uh, informal contacts uh, are not usually documented, although it can be a good idea to diarise the contact just in case you need recourse to these times and dates in the future. Um, nor do they need to be done in, in private, the meetings that is. Checking, with, uh, checking in with your new employee at the start of each day and making sure they know uh, what's on the to-do list and what actions are priorities each day 
are a great way to keep track of performance at the grassroots and to gauge other aspects of behaviour that might be important to the job, such as timelines and the ability to meet schedules and prior prioritise tasks, etc. These informal con uh, contacts can help also motivate staff as well as increase their self-confidence and will also give you a feel of just how well or how not they're fitting in with the team and relating to other stakeholders and so on. You should try and offer guidance wherever possible and always try to keep any criticism constructive and offer sources or solutions to problems rather than just highlighting that they exist. Getting feedback from uh, the people a new employee uh, has been working with is another really important part of the probationary period. Ask them to be frank and honest and then you can filter these comments back to the new employee. Some will be positive and so build their confidence while others might like highlight areas that they need to improve. Now, with regard to the more formal process performance meetings, it's important that you go through each of the objectives and actions you initially put together and discuss progress, explore obstacles, and where appropriate, agree actions to overcome these obstacles. Just as you would in regular performance uh, review meetings, it's important that you praise uh, areas where the employee is making good progress, as expected, or better, or perhaps, and really highlight the latter. Explore areas where there are problems, and if the problems are sufficiently fit, severe that there's risk that the employee will be dismissed, then you will need to follow the, uh, the organisation's process for managing performance problems during uh, Probation. Use the positions agreed KPIs as both an agenda during the meeting and to update uh, the form after the meeting. It's recommended that you update the form after each meeting and, and then use the updated version at your next meeting. Uh, if an employee's performance is below expected standards, make sure that you as a manager understand your responsibilities and follow all the procedures carefully. When managing poor performance, there are a few points worthy of note here. Any action that you should take should be aimed at improving performance. You must be impartial and objective in your feedback and focus on the problem, not the person. So it's important that you don't discriminate on the grounds of gender, race, disability, age, sexual orientation, religion, belief, or any other irrelevant factor. It's also important that you're not seen as harassing the employee. The important and only factor to consider is here is how well the person's doing their, his or her job and the extent to which they're achieving their objectives and how they're performing against expected standards of behaviour and so on. Keep all performance discussions confidential between you and the employee. Uh, this means that you need to find a private place to meet uh, so that you can give each other feedback and have discussion without anybody overhearing it or eavesdropping or without interruptions. Keep uh, any forms or other records and notes you retain secure and confidential. For example, not in shared folders or uh, unlocked drawers. Uh, this is an important consideration that can sometimes be overlooked in uh, performance uh, probationary management as it's not seen as being part of the formal management process uh, performance cycle. And so you may not be in the headspace to remember to keep personnel files secure. If you're meeting every week, then uh, you may have quite a bit of paperwork to keep track of and to keep secure. So take the time to set up the procedure at the beginning so it's easy to add your records as uh, required without compromising their security. Now, when managing uh, poor underperformance during probationary period, you must still follow the usual steps that you would take to manage poor performance uh, during on you know, for ongoing employees. That is, stage one, identify the, uh, the problem. Stage two, work towards improved solution. Stage three, formal reporting in the first trial period, stage four, decide on further action including dismissal and of course record keeping at all times. 
Many organisations work through their normal disciplinary procedures for full performance during probation, as frankly this provides uh, excellent documentation and due process in the case of claims down the track. The only difference with these stages or steps is the time frame. In probationary performance reviews, the time frame can be much shorter as uh, you'll need to complete all the stages within the probationary time frame, whereas for ongoing employees you have the discretion to allow more or less time to work, to work towards improvement. Well, it seems pretty straightforward, Michael, and you've made it very clear that there must be regular opportunities for feedback, discussion and review, and the document, documentation must be regularly completed. Now, we do need to move on to uh, the probation period and how the Fair Work Act provides the probationary period, but I am very concerned about time. We are running out of time very quickly, and I do want to get on to the questions. So, as I said earlier, this will be made available to you. So, I am going to skip Michael, just to confuse you, I'm going to skip to our last topic today on reports and record keeping. You've mentioned it quickly, uh, briefly. Yep. So if you could um, want to run us through you know, what's important about keeping records and rep reports and, and doing it correctly for us, Michael. Um, sure, okay. We, we, we've talked quite a bit about reports and records, but here are some uh, more points that I want to make before we close. Now. We're designing performance appraisal system for probationary employees. You need to make it flexible enough to, uh, to cover a range of performance and behavioural criteria. Uh, for example, depending on the job, you might like to consider quality of work, quantity of work, timeliness of work, cooperation and uh, collaboration, demonstration of knowledge uh, required for it, dependability, attendance, punctuality, knowledge of uh, organisational policies and objectives and uh, initiative and judgement, maybe uh, supervisory or, or uh, technical uh, uh, potential. You'll also need to design the system to be flexible but uh, uh, and only to appraise those things that are essential and desirable for immediate performance and maybe continuing performance. Now in regard to, uh, to the records kept during poor performance, you'd need to make sure you pass on the details of any formal warnings or dismissal to your department HR manager or the person responsible for HR. The, uh, the HR manager will assure that any consequential action such as informing payroll and security etc are completed and then file a record in both personnel file and uh, the central records which are usually held by HR. The next point I'd like to make is, is a probation report. Now the following example of a probation report uh, comes from the ACT Public Service. It's, it's a really very good tool and I strongly recommend that uh, organisations use something like this for every probationer. You can uh, see the design of this report streamline the process, uh, uh, ensuring that all aspects of performance are covered off. It makes the uh, process simple and quick to complete. Uh, perhaps you'd like to walk us through it, Sarah? Sure thing, Michael. Let's go through this quickly. I too think this is a very good example that is clear and to the point, and you can also use it as a base and add or subtract what you need for your own organisation. So the first section, Part A, simply lists all the reports required along with the dates for each one. I think this is a very efficient way of starting the process as both parties can see at a glance where they're up to and on what date. Parts B and C provide the personal and contact details of the probationary employee and their line manager or in this case the supervisor. And then from there on the form, state, the, state, uh, the form sta starts to measure and review performance starting with the leave record. So how many days, if any, has the new employee had during the period and why? You know, was it for sick leave and how many days was this satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Part E, as you can see, then lists the key aspects of performance and conduct identified by this employer and under each heading the line manager must nominate whether the behaviour has been satisfactory, unsatisfactory or requires development. There is also a section for comments below each one. Now you can see here that this form is looking at work behaviour such as attendance, relationships with others, general behaviour, quality and output of work, for example accuracy, frequency and seriousness of errors, drive and energy, relationships with clients, 
Uh, communication, now here this form is looking for quite specific features such as the ability to convey meaning without ambiguity, grammar, vocabulary, style, knowledge of departmental usage, spelling in both written and oral format. Depending on the type of organisation you may change this list. For example, the ability to manage meetings, um, conduct presentations and prepare reports or whatever depending on the job and the organisation. This section finishes with an overall assessment of job behaviour to date and any other comments. The, and the next section, FARM, deals with quite succinctly poor performance and any corrective action required in four key points. And then the form concludes with an overall assessment. The overall assessment uh, is followed by the overall recommendation. And this can be done as either regular probation progress report or a final probation report. Following on the for, uh, from the recommendations, what I also like about this form is the section that gives the employee the opportunity to make comment and provide feedback and then the requirement for both parties to sign off on the form and this assumes then that the employer has also read the form and the assessment. Now a form such as this is relatively simple to put together and pretty easy to fill in. It certainly won't add too much time to a meeting and can be done very quickly and simply leaving most of the time for discussion and feedback. Perhaps the one thing I would change on this form is under the section for corrective action uh, point D where I would add another option for training required and I'd add a space to nominate what and by when. But you can see that the simplicity of this form makes it very easy to change to suit the specific needs of your organisations as well as any specific or mandatory requirements on the job. It's certainly a very good starting point. Now sorry I cut you off earlier there Michael but I have had some questions come through that I do want to get answered so we will skip now to questions. And the first one is, how do I know what the minimum entitlement here is? Is it 6 or 12 months? Does the recruiting organisation have an obligation to explain this to new recruits or is it implied? No, you, you've got a, an obligation to explain it and agree it. Okay, that was short and sweet. Yep. <laughs> the next one, has the law recently changed? I thought the law did allow for compulsory probation. Uh, then I would refer people back to the Act. Okay. <laughs> no worries, he's a very sh short Michael. <laughs> Who needs to manage the probationary period? Does it have to be the line manager or could they nominate a 2IC? I'd much prefer the line manager rather than the 2IC because they'll be uh, further removed from immediate supervision. But what's crucial is that somebody manages it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, the next one is, what happens if the new employee announces they're pregnant during the probationary period? Can we decline to employ them? I'd be very, very careful about this because it, it depends, does the pregnancy impact upon their capacity to do the job? And uh, if it doesn't com uh, impact on their capacity to do the job, then you very much have to look at potentially a case for uh, harassment or uh, an action under the Equal Opportunities Act. It's a very tricky one there. Yep. The next one, I've got a couple more. What is, uh, what is there uh, nothing specific, or what if there is nothing specific about the new employee's behaviour and performance that you can put your finger on, but you know they aren't right for your organisation, can you still decline to employ them post probation? Uh, Sarah, you'd need to have reasonable grounds rather than just capricious grounds. You know, there might be something has got blue eyes and you like brown eyes. Well, <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> there has to be a reasonable grounds. It can't be capricious. Okay. And the final one I have here is I've experienced an employee who was excellent through the probation period but then turned once the period was over. What's the best way to manage that potentially happening? Uh, Sarah, I've had uh, direct experience of this. Um, uh, look, what I in the, the instance that I had, the uh, person performed very, very well during the probationary period. On the Friday, the ongoing employment was confirmed. On the Monday, a totally different person turned up. It was made very, very clear to us that the person did not want to be there. It took us a few weeks to, uh, to work out what it was, but uh, eventually it was just clearly that the person was looking for a payout. 
Now, um, again, you really have to document behaviour, document behaviour, document behaviour, document behaviour. And after you finish documenting it, document it again. <laughs> Okay, well that is all we have time for. I think we've gone well over time. Um, I do apologise for rushing through that section there, but as I said earlier, the presentation will be emailed to you so you can read all of that terrific information around the Fair Work Act that we didn't quite get to today. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar, this number seven. We're almost at the end of our second series and we're so pleased to have had you along. We've certainly enjoyed ourselves. If you do want to suggest a topic for our webinar, we would love to hear. Or if you didn't get your question answered by Michael, please don't hesitate to contact us anytime. You can visit our website, send us through an email, give us a call, like us on Facebook, or you can always go to YouTube and watch this and all the other previous webinars that we have done. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.